had a myocardial infarction and was incidentally found to have an abnormality in the chest x-ray. Once she recovered from her MI, she went on to have a CT scan. This showed an abnormality, as you can see, in the anterior part of the mediastinum. It is cystic in appearance, and it's got some loculation within the anterior, uh, within, the, within the mass. She was asymptomatic and she did not have any symptoms. But she clearly wanted this to be dealt with. So once she recovered fully, and after a few months, we, I think we followed her up uh, for six months, the mass was persistent and she was quite keen to have it excised. This turned out to be a, a thymic cyst which was resected, but not all time exists. You need to resect the ear. The patient was quite concerned about it and wanted it removed, and that's why it was excised. This is a chest x-ray again of an another patient who's a young patient with a CT scan showing abnormality in the paravertebral sulci on the left side. It's got quite smooth margins. And this is likely to be a neurogenic tumor, which was successfully excised. As you can see in the other plate, it's lying in the paravertebral sulci, smooth margins. CT scan did not show any evidence of intraspinal extension. She had an MR scan as well, which was satisfactory, and the lesion was successfully excised. This is a scan of another patient with, with, his, with a chest texture of another patient with quite a significant abnormality in the left side of the chest. On the CT scan, you can see a very well-defined mass, which is probably arising from the mediastinum. It's got well-defined borders. Uh, we biopsied this mass. It was a thymoma which was then successfully resected through the left sarcotomy. This is a chest x-ray and a scan of a young patient who's got several lymph significant lymphadenopathy within the uh, upper paratracheal region, the pretracheal region, and the subcranial region, sorry. And this was a sarcoid, which was proven on with, with EBUS sampling. Another X-ray, which shows a, a mass occupying the left chest, probably in the paravertebral sulci, but difficult to say on the chest X-ray. The scan shows the presence of a mass. This looks much more different than the previous ones. But it is well-defined. It is heterogeneous. There was no extent, extension into the spine. And this was a, a neurogenic tumor, which was successfully excised. OK, I'll stop there in view of the time. Thank you.
evening, everybody. Welcome back to another session in the SETS Ismailia Masterclass. It gives me great pleasure to finish the thoracic session uh, for day one with a brief overview of cardiothoracic trauma. So what we'll try to do is to basically go through the pathophysiology of thoracic trauma, address a few pertinent individual con conditions, the investigations, interventions, and damage control, and finally see what the follow-up would be. So the spread of thoracic surgeons and cardiothoracic trauma is in multivarious shapes and forms. So if you go to history, it's known that the Egyptians have recorded chest trauma going back to the Edward Smith papyrus dating thoracic trauma to 3000 years BC. Homer's described it in the Greek literature, both blunt and penetrating injuries. Hippocrates has done that. And then we have a variety of medieval surgeons who defined what we use as cardiothoracic trauma, largely thanks to all the military conflicts in Europe during the Middle Ages. However, if you fast forward, when you take about cardiac trauma, they have been quite strong statements made. The first ever pericardiosynthesis was in 1829 by Larry. We all know Bill Roth, the famous Bill Roth of Bill Roth 1 and 2 gastrectomies, who stated any surgeon who should attempt to suture a wound of the heart would lose the respect of his colleagues. However, Ludwig Renn did that in 1895 in a gentleman with fencing injury. James Paget said surgery of the heart has probably reached its limit set by nature. No new method or discovery can overcome the natural uh, difficulties that attend to the wound of the heart. Again, famous statements, but we have defied all of that. So the first resuscitation post-injury was in 1901. 1902 found the first cardiography in the USA. The resuscitative pre-hospital thoracotomy was in 1993 and resuscitative pre-hospital thoracotomy for a cardiac stab wound in the United Kingdom was in 1993. So it's evolved over millennia, but we are where we are. But the management of penetrating injuries has again evolved significantly due to military experience. The mortality for a thoracic trauma in the First World War was 50%. And in the Vietnam War, it was 3%. And the key is most of these wounds were managed with just a simple intercostal chest strain. So that's the key message there. So the mechanism of injury could be blunt, penetrating, or in present day's world, blast injuries as well. So blunt injury causes direct trauma to the chest. It results in chest wall injury, wherein you end up with fractures, flail chest, open wounds, and the pressure effect causes secondary lung damage. You can have deceleration of the body causing torsions and tears. And you also have an element of crush, which results in contusion and rupture. How do these mechanisms manifest? They manifest as fractures, hemoneumothorax, pulmonary contusion, air embolism, aortic injury, diaphragmatic injury, and embedded foreign bodies if there is missiles involved. Penetrating trauma is much less than blunt trauma commonly due to stabs, impalement injuries, and gunshots, where an extra element is added, which is the projectile velocity, the projectile movement, and the number of projectiles. Again, the manifestation in the body is almost identical to blunt trauma. The penetrating injuries depend on the site, the depth, the direction, and cleanliness. This young lady looks like she's got lots of stabs on her chest, but fortunately, none of them actually breached the pleura. So she ended up with a lot of subcutaneous and wrist injuries, but nothing were life-threatening. So it depends on how deep the wound is. Blast injury has a combination of the direct trauma and pressure wave. It causes tissue duct disruption, and the microvascular injuries are manifested due to tears in the blood vessel and alveolar tissue, causing severe contusions, disruption of tracheobronchial tree and myocardial contusion. All of this can lead to post-traumatic respiratory compromise. And how does that manifest? It is due to loss of mechanics when we have flail chest, have obstruction with blood, tracheobronchial disruption and pneumothorax. Ventilation perfusion mismatch, that's due to the pulmonary contusion, hematoma, collapse and secretions. <clears throat> 
pain in itself causes hyperventilation, hypovolemia, all of these result in hypoxia, hypercarbia, ultimately resulting in acidosis. So classification of chest injury, for those of you who were here this morning, I said chest injuries in the anatomy session were classified as central chest injuries and peripheral chest injuries. The central chest injuries are severe and serious and require immediate surgical attention or intervention as it involves the great vessels, trachea, main bronchi, esophagus, spinal cord and proximal great vessels and intrathoracic abdominal contents like spleen, stomach and liver. Whereas the peripheral injury largely affects the parenchyma, may affect the great vessels and diaphragm. The skeletal injuries are rib fracture, flail, chest, first and second rib fracture and sternal fracture and traumatic chest wall loss when it involves a blast or a severe penetrating injury like somebody falling on a fence post. Now the first rib injury is a hallmark of impending danger because if that's broken then there is bound to be damage to vascular structures coming out of the chest. Pulmonary injuries manifest as hemoneumothorax. There is lung laceration, tracheobronchial injuries and bleeding. They can have pulmonary contusion, air embolism because the proximity of the tracheobronchial tree to the vasculature and finally embedded foreign bodies. So pneumothorax is a common thing which we see. This x-ray should not have been done. So what you see here is a patient intubated with a massive tension pneumothorax a few refractions with flailed segments and mediastinal shift. So pneumothoracis could be, because tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis, it could be open, closed, or tension, wherein air accumulates in the pleural space, which causes lungs to collapse, alveolar collapse, and reduced oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Massive hemothorax is another problem which we face, wherein pleural space is filled with blood. Now, Hemorrhage may accumulate, the pleural space could accumulate easily 1500 to 3000 mils of blood. The patient ends up with hypovolemic shock and respiratory compromise, and the mortality is almost significantly high, 75% if it is not managed well. Pulmonary lacerations are due to avulsion and traction and causes damage to the pulmonary uh, architecture. This could be classified as type 1 lacerations, wherein it is due to the elastic compression of the chest wall causing lung rupture. This is more in young patients. Type 2 are in the lower chest wall due to the compression and shear ring tear, quite rare. Third is peripheral lacerations due to rib fracture, so when the lung is punctured by ribs, which happens in older patients. And fourth is lacerations accompanying a previous pleuropulmonary adhesion. But ultimately the management of any of these things are going to be management of the pneumothorax, or if there is persistent bleed and air leak, then a surgical intervention. Contusion occurs in almost a third to two third of patients with significant blunt trauma. It's frequently associated with rib fracture. The microvascular hemorrhage may account for about a liter to a liter and a half of blood in the alveolar tissue. So you have to be mindful that there will be unquantified blood loss within the lungs. You may have pneumothorax, you may have hemothorax which comes out in the drain, but there may be loss of volume in the pulmonary architecture. Systemic air embolism is a life-threatening condition. This happens in central penetrating injuries, wherein the stab or the injury communicates the bronchus with the vasculature air from the pulmonary tree gets into the pulmonary vein, causing arrest. The immediate remedial man management is to get the patient head down and you may have to open uh, the chest and decompress the ventricle to let the air out and then repair the injury. Retained foreign bodies can be part of broken objects, missiles, debris. So as you can see in the top image, you have a knife with a blade which is broken. So this has gone right into the chest with no way of taking this out. Unfortunately, we managed to get it out with a thoracoscopic assessment and were able to traction and push the knife out and grasp it. This unfortunate soul ended up on a fence post. Unfortunately, although it looks 
scary because this is the umbilicus, the head end. So this is almost just below the costal margin. There wasn't any major damage to internal structures. Now, cardiac injuries can be life-threatening. A lot of them die in the field if not recognized and treated, particularly tamponade and hemorrhage. If they reach the hospital, then the chances of survival improve. The commonest injured structure is the right ventricle, followed by the left ventricle, the right atrium, and then the left atrium and great vessels. And the patients can be stable to massive hemothorax or pericardial tamponade and succumb. So it varies, the manifestation varies between patients and where the site of the injury is. The right side is more commonly injured and the RV injuries survive than the LV injuries for simple reason. It is a low pressure area and it is much more tamponaded with the pericardium. Whereas the left ventricle injuries are a high pressure area and the jet volume of fluid may in a sense cause tamponade and death. Atria and inflow and outflow track are rare and the treatment is resuscitation, pericardial synthesis, and always assume there is more damage than just the cardiac wall, because there may be internal structures which are damaged due to the stab. When I was a young resident up in Glasgow, we got a phone call from one of the referring hospitals saying, oh, can you take this patient? This patient's ECG is becoming flat every now and then. And I spoke to my boss and he said, obviously this is not happening but bring the patient because the, that hospital doesn't know how to manage this boy. So the story is this boy is a fisherman who was stabbed and his friends decided to take a fishing line to repair the wound. He then develops a hemothorax, which was treated locally. And again, he came with fainting episodes when they admitted and found the ECG was going flat. The patient arrives in our unit. I'm assessing the patient and whatever they told me was happening to me the ECG just went flat. So we did an emergency pacing wire and then he had an echo and investigation which revealed the stab had gone, taken the mitral valve apparatus and had severed the AV bundle. So always never underestimate the internal damage with cardiac stabs, always have an open mind. Pericardial tamponade is the major complication which is life-threatening after pericardial chest trauma. It, impairs diastolic filling of the heart and the classical Beck strand, we all know is hypertension, venous distension and muffled heart sounds, globular heart, patient is unstable. You may be able to do a bedside echocardiography or pericardial synthesis or a quick subsequent pericardiotomy is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Now diaphragmatic injuries are a challenge because they're not always picked up. It can happen more in penetrating trauma than blunt trauma. A third of them, of all penetrating trauma, have an element of diaphragmatic injury. It's only a third are picked up before surgery. So you need to have a high index of suspicion depending on the site to expect that there may be underlying diaphragmatic injury. The media style injuries could have traversing injuries. It causes serious injury to vital organs. It requires careful evaluation by early thoracotomy for the hemothorax tamponade. And further evaluation may be required with an angiography, esophagoscopy, bronchoscopy, echocardiogram. And the choice of incision and the access depends on the findings. Esophageal injuries in trauma are rare. It's because it is quite well buttressed between the spine, the iota, and uh, the tracheobronchial tree and the heart. So most often they're not other major injuries will cause the patient harm than esophageal injuries, but you have to have a suspicion, especially in blunt trauma, and you may have to do the investigations, including gastrographin or esophagoscopy before making a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, tracheal bronchial injuries are rare, but when they manifest, once you've seen it, you'll never forget. So rapid deceleration, can cause tracheobronchial disruption. It is more common in the right side because the right lung is larger. The right main bronchus is long, uh, unsupported as opposed to the left main bronchus. And the patient manifests with pneumothorax and surgical emphysema, may have persistent air leak, and the chest X-ray will give you the classical hallmark, which is a fallen lung sign. Iodic injury usually occurs 
in the proximal descending aorta at the isthmus area where the ligamentum arteriosum anchors the aorta. So when you have a sudden deceleration, you can have a bell clanger effect. So the aorta is fixed in one point, the rest of the aorta is pulled forward and that can cause the disruption. The other mechanism wherein aorta is disrupted is the osseous pinch uh, mechanism wherein the sternum and the spine hit against each other due to rapid deceleration and the iota is pinched in, in between. So both of these cause damage to the intima and media and the increase in intraluminal pressure causes dissection or disruption. Great vessels, again, you have to suspect them, especially if it involves upper torso injury, particularly involving the first ribs. You'll have the winding of mediastinum, depression of the left main bronchus, hematoma in the left apex, massive hemothorax, deviation of the esophagus, loss of the aortic lump. All these are image signs which should prompt you to suspect great vessel injury. Blunt aortic injury is about 15% of all deaths following motor vehicle is due to the thoracic aorta. Most of them die at the scene due to complete transection. Survivors may have small tears and they may have formed pseudoneurysms. These patients are usually metastable in that they drop their blood pressure. The drop in blood pressure reduces the leak from the tear and the patient's stable. However, after a period of time, the resuscitation measures, which is constituted to correct the hypovolemia, increases the blood pressure and they start bleeding. So it's a vicious cycle and one has to recognize this to act readily. So what's the optimum early management? So field management, so pre-hospital management, one could do the ABC and with no delay, you scoop and run to the definitive management. There are certain places where you will have to manage it in the field. A sucking chest wound, wherein you may have to do a three-way dressing. So a dressing with three-way adhesives so that it forms as a flap. So it doesn't suck in air, but it lets air get out. Or you could use things like an Asherman's chest seal for that matter. Attention pneumothorax and pericardial tamponade are best treated in transit rather than wait till you reach the hospital. Early management is primary secondary survey. As per the ATLS principle, ABCD approach, one would need to do chest X-ray, ABG, ECG, pulse oximetry and bloods, establish the nature of the injury, is it penetrating blunt, the trajectory. And most often they're not these days after the patient's resuscitated, one would do a trauma CT. So always have a high index of suspicion of internal organ damage. The ready trauma filled chest X-ray will tell us hemothorax, widened mediastinum, pneumothorax, but a contrast CT will give us more wrinkling. And there may be instances where we may have to do a CT angiogram. So as you can see, there is widened mediastinum and you can see in the CT, there is disruption of the iota. And on the angiogram, you can see extravasation of the tie with pseudoaneurysm formation. Tracheobronchial injuries are a bit challenging, especially if you do not have a definitive fallen lung sign and there is surgical emphysema. So we may have to do a bronchoscopy. And the key is careful intubation in these patients because there is always a possibility the damage may be aggravated by rapid intubation. So it is always best it is done in a selective uh, specialist center. So if the patient is stable, that patient should be tra transferred to a specialist unit rather than attempt things on the field or on the hospital without ex expertise. In civilian practice, most of them, most of thoracic trauma are ma best managed with supportive therapy and chest drainage. The remaining 10 to 15% may require a major intervention. Always remember the pain, the pulmonary collapse will lead to respiratory tract infections. So antibiotics, adequate pain relief, including epidural if need be, humidified oxygen and nebulizers, chest physiotherapy and mobilization wherever possible. The intercostal drain is one of the life-saving uh, interventions in these patients. It's a most commonly performed cardiothoracic trauma intervention. The goal fundamentally is to restore the negative intrathoracic pressure. So one goes in the triangle of safety, which is bordered by the two axillary fold and the sixth rib and 
you would go in into the fourth or the fifth intercostal space with a finger dissection with a good sized chest ring. I've said already that pericardiosynthesis is used uh, in the ED setting or in trauma setting to decompress a pericardial tamponade before a definitive procedure is done. Most often they're not these days, a pericardial window is done rather than pericardial synthesis. But you start below the ziffy sternal, uh, ziffy chondral junction and the needle is advanced cephalad towards the left scapula. And the key is to watch the ECG as this procedure is done. So once the needle is inside the pericardium and it touches the ventricle, you will have STT changes. So you know that you've gone deep enough. 100 mils can cause tamponade. So if there is blood, it'll temporize, but the patient would need exploration and cardiography. And depending on where the wound is, it is either suture primarily with proline or buttressed sutures, as you can see here. But be mindful of putting your sutures in relation to the coronary arteries. So it's always better to have a specialist helping you if you can control the bleeding and a simple measure of putting a Foley's catheter into the stab and inflating and pulling it out will temporize till a cardiac surgeon comes to help you because what we don't want to be doing is try to suture and tie that and tie off the blood supply to the heart as well. What are the indications for surgery in thoracic trauma? <clears throat> it can be life-saving emergency operations wherein there is damage control, early surgery for major injuries, and late surgery for sequelae. So the emergency thoracotomy done either on the roadside or in the ED is to control bleeding, to do direct cardiac massage in arresting patient following penetrating trauma, to clamp the pulmonary hilum in terms of major bleed. So how do you clamp? You open the chest and you scoop the blood out and you can use a big vascular clamp and clamp the hilum in total. So that's the artery, the veins, and the bronchus to stop bleeding from one side of the chest. You could put a sling around and snug the whole thing. Or worst case scenario, if you don't have time for any of those, you can do what is called as a hilar twist, wherein you sweep the inferior pulmonary ligament up and just twist the lung as a torsion on its own axis to stem the bleeding. So these are life-threatening conditions where you want to stop the bleeding one way or the other so that you can then have hemodynamic stability to intervene further. Acute deterioration and hemodynamic instability. Hemorrhage of greater than two liters in the first four hours or persistent discharge of 200 for more than four hours. 400 mils in here are a traumatic thoracotomy where the injury has caused loss of the chest wall, massive air leak, air embolism, and tracheobronchial injuries are all indications for an early thoracotomy. How do we approach thoracic trauma? I've already told about the pericardial synthesis. So the key things which we do are subzifoid pericardial window, left anterior thoracotomy, clamshell, and lateral thoracotomy or a sternotomy. So in patients with hemothorax, the subsifoid window, the sensitivity is 100% and specificity is 92%, whereas the echocardiogram is much lesser. So you feel this ziffy process, you make a midline incision and sweep under the ziphoid and you can feel the pericardium, which is grasped with two forceps and an incision is made. It's a longitudinal pericardiotomy, and you have to be careful because the phrenic nerves will be on the lateral aspects. A left anterior thoracotomy is a lifesaver in trauma. Somebody asked this question after the morning session. So you count down, you use the pectoral, subpectoral region as your landmark. You can count upwards from the costal margin. You make the incision, and once you're in, you again have to work upwards because 
the last thing you want is to enter the chest in the sixth or the fifth intercostal space. So you always work upwards so that you have access to the pericardium to relieve a tamponade or to massage a heart or to put your hand in and do a hilar twist. If you're then suspecting the injuries involving the other side, you can cut across the sternum or use a giggly star to convert this into a clamshell incision. All you need to do a left anterolateral thoracotomy is a knife and an able assistant. You do not need even a diathermy because the patient won't have any circulation, so you just run with it. So a left thoracolateral uh, thoracotomy across the ziphy, connected to a similar one on the right side, and it gives you a full access to the chest. You can deal with the heart, you can deal with the lungs, the hilum, and great vessels. And once you've had damage control, there may be a need to extend and do a lateral thoracotomy, especially if the injuries involve posterior aspects, but this is a life-saving quick trauma access. Most cardiothoracic surgeons would argue, I can get into the chest quickly with a median sternotomy because this is what I do day in, day out. If you have the equipment and the time, by all means do it, but this is a quick way of getting into the chest. For cardiac injuries, like I've said earlier, all you need is a finger in the hole, a Foley's catheter, and a direct suture with pledgets will do the trick. Now, you have to be careful about the vasculature, but always look for associated injuries with an on-table TOE, because this may not be the only injury to that heart. For the lung, if it's simple laceration, you have to suture it. If there is a tract, then you do a tractotomy. If the laceration is peripheral and it's too damaged, you can do a wedge excision. Sometimes you may end up doing a lobectomy or a traumatic <laughs> nemonectomy. And likewise, tracheobronchial injuries are repaired with primary suturing and the vasculature are done the same way. So there's your lung laceration. It's fairly small. All you need is do a few sutures, or you could pick this up with a dual and just go underneath with a staple to excise and exclude it. So a tractotomy is when the stab has gone right through the lung. So what you do is pass one limb of the stapler in and then staple it and lay the tract open and you oversue any bleeding or parenchymal damage. Emergency nemonectomy can be readily done with a giant stapler. So you just take the largest stapler which is available, go straight to the hilum and clamp everything. These patients have very poor uh, outcome with high mortality. <clears throat> this wall defects, you may have to do a mass closure and hope that it doesn't get infected and revisit it. You've heard Mr. Kalkar telling you about the principles of chest closure, chest wall resection, and how it is important to maintain sterility. But in a situation like this, you may have to bite the bullet and secure the patient's stability before a definitive procedure later. Esophageal injury, if it's early and it is recognized, you can prepare primarily. If not, it is drainage, diversion, and resection even at a later date. So the four tubes are important, the chest drain, NG tube, the feeding jejunostomy tube, and the gastrostomy tube so that patients maintain. Diaphragmatic injury, do we approach it from the chest? Do we approach it from the abdomen? Do we do it thoracoscopic? All depends on the experience and the expertise, but you have to close it with non-absorbable suture. Use a mesh if it requires. Iotic injury are dealt with by specialist cardiac surgeons with cardiopulmonary bypass. Yes, you can clamp and sew. Yes, you can do it on partial bypass, but there is associated risk of paraplegia and other injuries. Sometimes these patients may come at a later date for follow-up. So always have follow-up visits for these patients to look at other injuries and late sequelae of trauma. They may have to have surgery for persistently retained hemothorax, empyema, or foreign bodies. In this case, there is a nice glass piece which is sitting on the diaphragm, which is removed thoracoscopically. So in conclusion, supportive therapy and chest drainage will be sufficient to treat majority of chest trauma patients. A small proportion may require surgical intervention, and that depends on the nature of the injury. And the surgery has a wide spectrum. However, it comes with wide levels of morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Since the advent of cardiac surgery 60 years ago, 
intraoperative myocardial protection or cardioplegia respectively has been an essential part of open heart procedures. Experimental and clinical research on this particular field is still continuing because an optimal or ideal cardioplegic solution has not been established. In the past, surgeons focused, among other criteria, on intra-ischemic myocardial energy turnover or morphology, while today safety and convenience are the main parameters for evaluation of any cardioplegic method. Regarding surgeons' convenience, it is obvious that cardioplegic reperfusions or administration of maintenance solutions are the most inconvenient and time-consuming procedures. The following remarks focus on a method to avoid such cardioplegic reperfusions without compromising patients' safety. The answer to this progress is called custodiol. Since the advent of cardiac surgery 60 years ago, intraoperative myocardial protection or cardioplegia respectively has been an essential part of open heart procedures. Experimental and clinical research on this particular field is still continuing because an optimal or ideal cardioplegic solution has not been established. In the past, surgeons focused, among other criteria, on intra-ischemic myocardial energy turnover or morphology, while today safety and convenience are the main parameters for evaluation of any cardioplegic method. Regarding surgeons' convenience, it is obvious that cardioplegic reperfusions or administration of maintenance solutions are the most inconvenient and time-consuming procedures. The following remarks focus on a method to avoid such cardioplegic reperfusions without compromising patients' safety. The answer to this progress is called custodiol. Custodiol is a low sodium and low calcium cardioplegic solution and the only highly buffered compound available worldwide. Significantly, the histidine buffer represents the primary osmotic ingredient of the solution. In addition to its buffering capacity, histidine is one of the most effective scavengers of free radicals known with its mode of action comparable to mannitol. Due to its highly concentrated buffering capacity, this solution requires only a singular administration to initiate cardioplegic arrest. What are the indications to use Cusudiol? At first, pediatric cardiac surgery also valvular surgery, followed by aortic surgery, minimally invasive surgery, redo surgery, heart transplantation. Finally, it can also be used in coronary artery surgery. In accordance with Dr. Cooley's recommendation, Administration should be safe and simple, routinely using a 3 16 perfusion line and a 9 French aortic cannula.
for intraoperative cardioplegia and transplantation, anti-grade cardioplegic perfusion is preferred with necessarily a high volume perfusion. Furthermore, in this situation, the extended perfusion time must be considered as the total extracellular myocardial space requires adequate equilibration. Custodiol can be used at any patient age. However, in pediatric cases special considerations apply. The perfusion volume must be adjusted for the infant's age and perfusion time is shorter than in adults. Cardioplegic reperfusions appear to be harmful in neonates as the listed references clearly demonstrate. How do we administer custodiol? After aortic cross clamp it is first necessary to empty the aortic root and the left ventricle. Then the cardioplegic perfusion is started. The solution can be administered either by roller pumps or by gravity. Electrically induced ventricular fibrillation should be avoided before cardioplegic perfusion starts, since the coordinated ventricular contractions during the initial phase of cardioplegic perfusion result in optimal equilibration. The decrease in the arterial coronary venous PO2 difference is not affected by the mode of perfusion. The crucial reduction in the decline of the difference of arterial coronary venous oxygen partial pressure reflects reduced myocardial energy consumption which, in turn, correlates with a corresponding increase in myocardial cell energy content. The solution's temperature should be kept between 6 and 10 degrees centigrade. Any unused portion from the initial perfusion should not be stored in a refrigerator, as rewarming will decrease the solution's pH, adding to the acidotic shift in ischemic myocardium. As already mentioned, cardioplegic reperfusions are not usually necessary. If, for some reason, cardioplegic reperfusion is necessary, perfusion time should be limited to 1 to 2 minutes, equivalent to 200 to 400 ml. Time lapse is the primary drawback of any replegia. It is evident that replegia is well known to be harmful to the neonatal heart. In case of initial retrograde administration and of retrograde replegia, consider the physiological fact that only 70% of the coronary venous blood drains into the coronary sinus. Consequently, right heart failure constitutes the main risk of retrograde administration. One additional concern relates to blood pH after systemic custodial administration. The pH of this buffer containing solution is temperature dependent. At 34 degrees centigrade, the solution's pH is 6.9. We can predict the blood pH following systemic custodial administration and thereby calculate the pH shift towards acidosis that is solely attributable to physicochemical effects. How to manage custodial perfusion in patients with severe aortic insufficiency? Try to perfuse antigrately first. If the heart does not stop within three minutes, open the aortic root and continue with isolated left coronary perfusion. In most cases the heart will stop with this approach. If it does not, interrupt the left-sided perfusion 
and perfuse only the right coronary artery for one to two minutes and then continue the left-sided perfusion. If retrograde perfusion is preferred, perfusion pressure should be only 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Systemic administration leads to hemodilution, which can be prevented by a hemofilter. It has been suggested that systemic custodial administration leads to neurological seizures in neonates due to systemic hyponatremia. However, this is not the case. Studies from Norway and Italy demonstrated that an apparent hyponatremia based solely on measured laboratory serum concentrations is not causally related to seizure activity in this situation because it is isotonic. To prevent such hyponatremia, administration of 200 to 300 millimole sodium to the body's circulation is recommended. Obviously, sodium chloride must not be added directly to the cardioplegic solution because this would seriously interfere with its effectiveness. Our recent retrospective as well as prospective studies on systemic sodium content and osmolality clearly support the validity of our aforementioned protocol Thank you. I hope you all have enjoyed the long day and a short break. We said we will move on to pediatric cardiac surgery next, but we thought we will take any questions if there are so that the thoracic faculty can be thanked. So we do have a question. So are there any recommendations for traumatic tracheal repair? So I'm going to ask Mr. Kalkat to answer that question. Maninder. Yes, um, uh, the recommendation is uh, try to primarily repair it, uh, but I will recommend that this be a topic for discussion maybe next year because traumatic or iatrogenic airway injuries is a topic in itself. And for that matter, it will take quite a bit of time for me to go through the details of it. But by and large, if there is a traumatic tracheal injury, either uh, uh, penetrating, uh, penetrating or hydrogenic, uh, the idea is that we will try to repair. But with the hydrogenic ones, majority of time we'll observe them. You may not need to do anything. And again, it depends whether patient is intubated or non-intubated or on ventilator or not on ventilator. So this is a big topic in itself, and I would like uh, to to probably be given an opportunity to discuss with you sometime. Yeah. Thank you, Maninder. I'm sure you can demonstrate how it is done in real in Ismailia when we go there to run wet labs. So may I thank all our thoracic faculties for giving us a fantastic day. And without much delay, we will move to the last section of today's program, which is the pediatric cardiac surgery. We have two fantastic speakers. We have Shaki Musa, who's a consultant cardiac surgeon, pediatric cardiac surgeon from Bristol, and Ms. Karen Von Doom, a senior pediatric cardiac surgeon from Leeds. Over to you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I'll try and uh, um, can you can you guys hear me? Yes, Shaki. Thank you. Fantastic. Good. I'll try and uh, share my screen now and uh, we'll get going. <laughs> 
Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much for inviting me back to speak at the uh, Ismailia Ma Masterclass. It was a, a really um, enjoyable event um, when it was held two years ago, and it's great that uh, the organising committee have managed to sort of resurrect it on a virtual platform. Um, so I'll be talking about neonatal cardiac surgery for the next 25, 30 minutes or so. Um, and that's really because um, in the last talk that I gave, I covered some of these conditions. Today, I only have half an hour. So I thought I would focus on uh, some common conditions requiring surgery in the neonatal period. So we'll start with uh, arch problems. So coarctation, hyperplastic aortic arch and interrupted aortic arch, and, and then move on to surgery for transposition of the great arteries. Uh, and then the third topic will be truncus arteriosus, and then we'll round off with uh, surgery for hyperplastic le left heart syndrome and its variants. Um, I am not going to cover uh, any palliative procedures such as uh, systemic to pulmonary artery shunts or PA banding. And um, I um, will keep the talk um, relatively basic because I understand there are many trainees in the audience and um, this really is um, aimed at them to give them a flavor and in, an introduction uh, into um, neonatal uh, cardiac surgery. So we'll go straight in with coarctation of the aorta. Um, a common condition presents as about 6% of all congenital heart disease. Uh, and you can see from the diagram here on the, um, on the right of the picture that it is essentially a narrowing of the aorta in the region where the ductus arteriosus would insert just distal to the left subclavian artery. Just forgive me a second, I'm just moving my zoom pictures around the screen. Um, there is often excessive ductal tissue involving the wall of the descending aorta and there are uh, associations uh, with Turner's syndrome, bicuspid aortic valve, and ventricular septal defect. In the neonate, the pathophysiology is um, acute obstruction, really. So uh, the neonate will present as a, a collapsed child um, as the ductus arteriosus closes. So when the duct closes, um, there is no longer any flow to the uh, descending thoracic aorta, uh, and there is um, acute circulatory collapse with acute left ventricular failure, loss of femoral pulses, and malperfusion um, to all of the vascular beds that are subtended by the, um, this, uh, the descending thoracic aorta. If the coarctation is less severe, um, these children will often present uh, slightly older, perhaps in heart failure at the age of around six, six weeks to eight weeks, or perhaps even as an, as an older child with a, a chance uh, hearing of um, a murmur or the presence of upper limb hypertension uh, found on um, sort of uh, when other uh, conditions are being um, investigated. Going back to the neonate, then the initial management is to start a prostaglandin infusion to uh, reopen the ductus arteriosus and establish uh, blood flow to the lower body. And uh, the uh, patient may need to be ventilated and need inotropic support to further take control of the circulation. The treatment um, uh, following the initial management is to proceed to surgical repair. If you're unable to open the duct and so you cannot um, encourage flow to the distal thoracic vascular beds, uh, or uh, the vascular bed supplied by the distal thoracic aorta, um, this, this should be done as an emergency. So um, there are four established methods for surgical repair, uh, resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis, top left, subclavian flat, top right, uh, patch aortoplasty, uh, bottom right, and resection and extended end-to-end -end anastomosis, um, uh, bottom right. What's the difference between all these, um, uh, these methods? Well, the first sort of method that was used was the end-to-end -end anastomosis. The problem with it is, is that it has a relatively high rate of re-coarctation. The subclavian flap 
um, necessitates sacrifice of the left subclavian artery and takes longer. And uh, when I talk to you about the technique, you'll, you'll appreciate that the aorta will have to be cross clamped uh, during the repair. And so a longer cross clamp time is not so desirable. Patch aortoplasty has been used previously, but uh, leads to a high rate of false aneurysms. Um, and then finally, the extended end-to-end -end anastomosis is the preferred method uh, because the, of the lowest rate of recoarctation, still around 10%, but, but lower uh, than other methods. So coarctation is mostly repaired through a left thoracotomy, uh, doesn't require the use of cardiopulmonary bypass, um, clamps to uh, the um, transverse arch and the descending thoracic aorta, uh, excision um, of uh, the coarct segment, and then an, an extended end-to-end -end anastomosis by spatulating the ends of both the transverse arch and the descending thoracic aorta, uh, and then uh, anastomosing the two together. What structures are at risk? Well, certainly when you're operating and mobilizing the aorta, uh, the thoracic duct and its branches um, are, are uh, small uh, vessels that sort of exist within the, in the uh, tissue that one would um, be mobilizing the aorta from uh, and therefore can, can become damaged. Uh, and then secondly, the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it passes around uh, the ductus arteriosus. So therefore, uh, chylothorax or car leak and vocal cord palsy are specific potential postoperative complications. And in my own practice, uh, I would suggest that, uh, well, I, I tend to suggest that we should only remove the chest strain after the child has been fed fully um, uh, so that there, we uh, exclude the possibility of chylothorax. Also, later in the postoperative period, observe for a hoarse cry. Um, and then, and if that is the case, one must warn against aspiration risk and ask for a review from uh, the ear, nose and throat team uh, and the speech and language therapists. As I've mentioned, uh, there is a risk of recoarctation, but this is uh, often amenable to balloon dilatation. The risk of recoarctation is around 10%. What about hyperplastic aortic arch? So um, a standard coarctation repair with an extended end-to-end -end anastomosis cannot address uh, narrowing of the proximal arch. So uh, 